I'm going to be talking about the PAL process. And the PAL process is what Kathy, actually, this is such a lovely graphic and much nicer than ours. So um, really, it's quite nice. But the same message is there. And we developed this curriculum planning process uh, from work with uh, high school teachers, actually, in a city a uh, little bit north of us. And the reason we developed it is to really concretize the UDL guidelines so that uh, teachers had a framework. So this morning, we looked at the guidelines from a curriculum pr uh, purchaser perspective. This afternoon, we're going to look at the guidelines from a lesson unit of study perspective. And uh, what we have with the guidelines, oops, wrong thing. Oh, sorry. Sorry. What we have with the guidelines is we want to start with a problem that you want to solve. So if you have lessons or units in which students are successful, you just kind of pat yourself on the back and you move on. And when I say the word successful, what we mean is really that they have achieved the goals, as Kathy talked about. That means that the learning experience was a successful one, the goals were clear, and all students were able to succeed in it. So I always think it's a good idea to pause, think about why that was effective, and then move on. But the lessons you want to start with, because teachers will often say, where do I begin? And so what the advice is, is to begin something that's going to happen in the near future. School is starting in September. You might start thinking about, from a teacher's point of view, um, what am I going to be teaching in se September that I can already predict that some students will not be able to achieve the goals? Those are the problems that you want to solve. The lessons where you can, and you can, you can just predict. You, my kids won't get factors. My kids won't get this or that. Start there. And then when you start there, you start by saying, OK, what's the, what are my goals? Uh, what's the context? What's the learning experience? All the same kind of thing. And this is a recursive. And we'll go through this just a little bit. Then you analyze what are the current methods, materials, and assessments that you're using. Then you think about what are the potential barriers. And from the barriers, you look at the UDL guidelines. You teach the lesson. You pause, reflect, did all my students achieve the goals? That's what it was. And the way you figure that out, of course, is that you look at your assessment. Very simple process, one that's been reinforced by what Kathy has said. So um, the UDL curriculum framework, planning for all learners, and you've heard me say this before, the, uh, the goal is to minimize barriers maximize opportunities. That's what we're doing so that all students can achieve the goals. OK. Uh, when we talk about curriculum, and we're actually talking about the use of that word right now, but right now we do talk about curriculum. We talk about curriculum being goals, methods, materials, and assessment. Learning experience is also a very nice way to talk about it. Instructional practices, people have talked about maybe using that term. But uh, for today, we're using the term curriculum, but we're considering changing that. Because oftentimes, uh, schools think about curriculum as they associate that with scope and sequence. And we really are moving beyond that. But to really take into account the instructional goals, methods, materials, and assessment. Oh, this works. Keep forgetting. OK. So the goal is the starting place. And it's really quite um, important. You have to clarify your goal. So what we might say is when you're identifying your goal, be aware if the means is embedded in the goal. And so if the how is embedded in the goal, it doesn't mean it's a bad goal. It just means you have to be aware of that. Because if you embed the means in the goal, so what happens is you're providing one way to get there. So uh, we're going to just go through a few goals. And if, you, if the goal is a skill goal in which you want the means embedded, then you have to just recognize some students aren't going to be able to achieve that. And you have to embed supports or scaffolds to ensure that all students can achieve the goal. So understanding the goal is a primary starting place. So um, what we're doing, is, as I said, this is just raising awareness. And Every time a goal is put up there, 
kind of had that little internal voice saying, are the means embedded? It's OK, but just recognize you're going to have to support or scaffold it. So I am so sorry. I have, um, can you, I, there's, well, maybe we'll just jump here. I had a series of goals that we're going through, and somehow or other this PowerPoint is not the right one I was working on last night. So we'll go here for a minute. Um, I'm going to jump to this. This is a goal, which is students will understand the relationship between experimental and theoretical probability. That is typically a middle school kind of goal. Are the means embedded in that goal? No. No, no means. So that's an open-ended goal in which you can actually say that possibly all students could achieve that goal. If, uh, Kathy, did people pass out that paper that I had for them? People should have a little. OK, perfect. OK. So we're going to actually, um, don't take it out yet. We're not going to, and uh, paper clips need to be passed out. So maybe two per aisle. Yes? Sorry, I, I don't know what paper you're talking about. Uh, there is a paper that is a one sheet black and white. Um, let, me, let me show you. Yeah. It looks like this. It has a little spinner on it. How many people do not have that? It went around. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so we'll get them in. They were supposed to have been picked. They're coming. They're, They're coming. coming. So just ignore that for a bit while we get the tools that we need. So um, we met with a group of sixth grade teachers. And the discussion started by, what is the problem? Math teachers. What is the problem that uh, needs to be solved? So the math teachers told us that their students uh, don't do well on the standardized um, high stakes testing in Massachusetts in the area of probability. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't get it. So we started out with a problem that they wanted to solve. We knew the goal, but the students were not achieving the goal. So after we had that little discussion, it's like, what is the problem that needs to be solved? Then we had to go down the path of, what are you currently doing in your math class? So this is the question, central question. And this is the, these are the materials that they were just using. They were using a page from the math workbook. And actually, that is the printed file that you're getting, is the page from the math workbook. That's only, now this is one lesson. Probability, of course, is a series of lessons over several days. But we chose one lesson to highlight. And they use pretty traditional paper, pencil, paper clips. And they lecture, is their method. Okay. So it's fairly um, traditional in how they teach probability. And in fact, it is traditional that they do something called uh, the spinner. I don't know if you have ever done that in your class environment. And we're going we're gonna to actually try that. So I'll wait until everybody has their little uh, paper. Okay. Now just envision this is in a workbook. And it's a uh, good series, but it's in a workbook. And we copied it through fair law, fair use laws. OK. OK. Is everybody set with their uh, materials? Anybody need anything? Okie dokie. Okay. Oh, good. Actually, sharing is good because you're going to share anyway. OK, so not a problem. OK, remember, this is the goal. And you're going to put yourself in um, sixth grade math class right now. Anybody anxious about that? Raise your hand if there's any anxiety about sixth grade math class. Just a few of you. OK, pretty good. OK, thank you. You do know that math is the only subject in which they talk about math anxiety. They don't talk about social studies anxiety, but math anxiety. OK, that's pretty good. OK, this is the goal. And you may choose. OK, sorry, getting materials all sorted out here. Just like middle school. OK, it's, it's the students in the back we're waiting for. OK. <laughs> OK. Um, 
you may choose to work alone or with a group of two to four. That's your choice. Okay? Is that a mistake in middle school? I don't think so. I don't know. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so this is your challenge. You have a uh, worksheet. Excuse me, I'm going to just borrow this for a minute, Evelyn. You have a um, worksheet at your disposal, and you are to read the math problem. And as you can see on the screen, it's uh, very high tech. It's a pencil and a paper clip, so you should have the tools of the trade. And um, you just put your pencil in the middle, put your paper clip uh, at the point of the pencil, and then spin away. And remember, where we want to get to is to under we want to understand the relationship. So I can ask you, can you please tell me the relationship between experimental and theoretical probability? So. Um, <coughs> Work with your partners. We're going to give you probably about three minutes to do this. Oh, you, you need a pencil. OK. Yeah, it is like middle school. I'm trying to interpret your smile. Oh, good. All right, that's good. Okay. All right, students, are you ready? Uh, remember uh, the goal. Uh, the goal is to understand experimental and theoretical in relationship to uh, theoretical probability. Would someone like be able to be able to tell me about that and how what you learned from that task? I noticed a lot of people that were very focused. I also noticed a few of you, I hate to say, were probably doing something else during this time period. <laughs> and I didn't want to embarrass you by coming over, but I was aware of it. Uh, and I got my grade book, so we're all set. Uh, in terms of the activity, because this, and there are some that can't even stop, they're still doing it. <laughs> And they're ignoring me completely. <laughs> okay. In terms of um, the activity, this actually is an activity that is supported. And uh, in the book that the students use, um, it is color coded orange and white. So you have the words red, blue, green, and yellow, and you're using the colors orange and white. I have a fabulous assistant. When she printed this out for me one time, she printed it out with the correct colors. And I said, no, no, Leslie, I want it in orange and white because. And she had to go back and reprint. OK, uh, the question we want to ask is, what are the barriers to achieving the goal? What did you encounter? What were some barriers? Did it, I mean, this is the goal. What were the, yes? So at first, it just kept going yellow, 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 until oh, we realized we had to kind of adjust. It took you a bit to figure that out. OK. <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't smile at that. She That's great. She lost at first. Yeah. Ah, she lost. And remember, middle school students. At least she only lost the paper clip and didn't flip it across the room. Yeah. And then also, uh, environmental factors influence the spinning. OK, other barriers. Yes? Was it good for, uh, for collaboration? If you have a, a classroom, now numbers are going back up in the states anyway as students. There are 30 students in our classroom, so they would probably have a similar difficulty with closed space. Right, exactly. OK, good. So it wasn't conducive to collaboration. Other things that were a barrier to you achieving success to get to this. Yes? You needed finger dexterity, absolutely, because you really, I mean, this is a skill that not all students can do that. OK, good. Something else, yes? We both presume that everyone on the task will have their. Absolutely, that we know what 
experimental and theoretical probability mean? Thank you. Right. Yes. The instructions are in the disabled print. I couldn't read them. That's right. You couldn't read the instructions. That's exactly right. Because they're hard to read. And not only are they in print, uh, they're exhibiting print disabilities, they're also dense in comprehension disabilities. So they actually are both small. OK, other things that you noted. I uh, obviously I didn't. And in a classroom, you'd obviously have more time. But that's right. Good. And you know, for some students, it doesn't matter how much time, because it's not the time that's the issue; it's the task and the understanding. Yes. Well, I wasn't really sure how to plot it. Exactly. What do you do to plot? Because it, and this is what David was talking about earlier: is construct uh, validity. Is that right? Construct. Yeah. Thank you, relevance. I knew validity wasn't right. Construct relevance, because what are we really asking students to do? We're asking them to spin. We're asking them to create a table or a graph or some visual representation. So we're asking them to figure out the means of collecting data. And uh, actually, one of my colleagues worked with the publishers of this particular activity, this particular series. And what they did is they made it more um, UDL in that they provided students with a couple of templates for collecting data so that they kept their eye on the goal and didn't let other things interfere. Anything else that might have been a barrier? So this is part of the process, is when you have a lesson that you can almost predict is not going to be successful, you pause, you think about what the goals are, and if it's a goal that embeds means, that's fine. If it's a goal that doesn't embed means, that's fine. You just have to figure out how to scaffold that. And then you have to think about what are the potential barriers. So I want to show you um, an alternative way to achieve the goal. And I'll just tell you a, a small, a short story. Is a colleague and I were in a sixth grade classroom doing a professional development activity with the teachers. But we were just observing. And the students were working on probability. And we said, this is fabulous. You know, they're going to tell us about probability. So we said to them, what is probability? And there was a small class, and um, they kept saying, and they kept giving us the formula of probability. They said, whatever the formula is, those kids knew the formula, but they did not know what probability was because they hadn't stepped back to figure out the why. Why are they even learning it? We're talking about authentic learning. Why are they learning it? So I'm going to show you an activity um, that. We serendipitously said, let's do this with the kids and see if they better understand probability. So let's see if we can all better understand probability. Uh, let me go here, go here. Uh, do people know the Shodor site, S-H-O-D-O-R? This is a fabulous takeaway if you have people that are in the math arena and they uh, teach students from kindergarten uh, through grade 12, Shodor off a free site. And it's just another way to represent the information. So I'm going to go to the Shoda site. Uh, here we go. Okay. This is uh, Project Interactivate. Sorry, let me just uh, resize this. So this will, what does that look like? Okay. So remember the goal. The goal is to understand experimental uh, probability in relationship to theoretical probability. So what we're seeing right here, and, and I will tell you right up front, there are clearly barriers to this site. I mean, there's no question. It cannot read aloud. I mean, so we can look at it from a barrier point of view and know that still this isn't going to work for everyone. But it gets us closer to achieving the goal. So um, we have the visual representation which is actually fairly true to the colors here. We have a representation of experimental probability and theoretical. Now we can have an opportunity, as they say, the teachable moment. You can talk to your students about what is theoretical probability. And you can talk about it being a constant in this particular instance. I mean, we can create something that is variable here. And now we can start looking at what is it. So let's just do one spin. And what do you predict is going to happen? Are we going to get closer to experimental and theoretical probability with one spin? No. OK, I'm going to go. No. OK, so all I do is I have one. 
and I'm going to say spin. Okay? So now what we see is, again, another opportunity to have the discussion and talk about experimental in relation to theoretical. And we have 100% in the gray, 25%. So let's increase that. And now we'll do two spins. And again, start thinking. And you can engage your students in thinking about the process of understanding probability. So I'm just going to go with two spins. And I'm going to see what happens. And you can start having them predict what, oh, that's right. I did two spins, sorry. And it uh, has a cumulative number. So we can see we have three spins. And we spun around. Now, students do not worry about the fact you don't see it spin around. They live in a video game world. A couple of teachers have said, I didn't see it spin around. But kids don't worry about that. <laughs> Another opportunity to have a discussion about experimental and theoretical probability. Again, we're getting a representation here. And I want another uh, representation. So I'm going to sh show results frame. So now I get to see, and I just want to minimize my screen a little bit. OK, there. We'll push it there. We'll just have to open and close it. So now you get another, now you get another representation of what the data looks like. So you can see 1 third, 2 thirds. You see it numerically. And you see another visual representation. So getting, again, a sense closer. So how many spins should we go this time? 100. 100, thank you. OK, so let's, and I only asked you to do 50 before. And remember the goal. See if you can better understand. Your head should always get wrapped around what the goal is. So I'm going to just type in 100 spins. And let's, before we jump into it, predict what's going to happen. What do you think? So, you said 100 spins. What do you think is going to happen? The experimental will get closer and closer to 25 for each. Do you think it will be 25 each? Um, no, because we have three already, and it's experimental, so no. No, OK. I'll tell you a fluky thing that happened once. It worked. It worked on three spins. No, on four spins, it went 25, 25, 25. Well, that blew the whole lesson. But OK. <laughs> so let's see how this works this time. So I'm going to spin. I'm going to watch this chart, because I'll get a visual representation. I'll keep my eye here, and let's spin. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Close, but really no cigar. OK, so we're not quite there yet. So who would like to try something else, a little bit more? Give me another number. Big one. Who's going to take a risk? Give me a big a number. Thousand. A thousand. That's a little bit of a risk. All right, so let's go with a thousand. And then again, remember, we're engaging students in discussion. And that's exactly what we did in this classroom. And they started focusing on, oh, experimental and theoretical. When is it going to happen? So I'll spin here. We have 1,103. We're not there yet. And I'll give you a little hint. You can spin up to 100,000 times each time. So I'm going to spin 100,000, and we're going to see what's going to happen. Is that 100? One more zero. Nope, that's a million. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. OK. Almost, but not quite. And we were asking you to do 50 spins and see if you could answer the question. And now, when we go back to the question, what is the relationship between experimental and theoretical probability? What is it? Talk to me about it. Somebody? What do you think? As the number goes up, the chance of the two meeting. As the number goes up, the chance of the two meeting. And we said to the students, well, you know, do you play your parents or anybody play the lottery? What are the chances of winning? All of a sudden it became authentic and they said, oh, we have very little chance of winning. <laughs> right, you have very little chance of winning. And they actually bet that you will get bet more and more because you have very little chance. It became an authentic lesson. In a, and I will say, in the same amount of time it took us, the students now could understand the relationship. They didn't know the formulas. I mean, and that is what you back it up with that. But they understood. Now, this did not work. We had a, a training once with a fellow who is uh, blind. 
And this was a major barrier, major barrier. He, and we even got the um, tactile spinner. And he finally said, Grace, don't worry about it. I will just be a cooperative partner. Because that wasn't working at all. That was really, I mean, so, so that had a major barrier. But for more students, and that's what you go for. Not every lesson is going to hit every student. You're increasing the chances of understanding, though, by thinking about multiple resources.